Today is a special day. Those of us gathered here for worship today represent a vi variety of diverse faith traditions, Catholic, Mennonite, LDS, Buddhist, among others. And here we are gathered today in a covenant of trust. We trust that we will act respectfully towards each other and we will hold space for our diversity. We trust that while we don't always agree on exactly how to live into our values or what the best way is to lead a spiritual and moral life, but we trust that our shared core values will allow us to worship together here in this sacred space. So no matter what your pr spiritual practice or religious identity is, this is a place of peace and inclusion, a place where we strive to live into our covenant our first principle, where we agree to respect the inherent worth and dignity of each person. A place where we agree to anchor ourselves in love as we explore what that covenant of inclusion and respect really means. And we know that we gather here in imperfect and unfinished ways. Here at Columbine, along with many UU congregations all along the across the country, we center our worship on a shared monthly theme. For January, uh, uh, here and many UU congregations have been considering the gift of liberating love and asking ourselves, what does liberating love actually mean? Love is the core of our faith. It is the center of our motivation to connect with each other and to protect each other. But I agree with Rabbi Boaz, who spoke here last week, when he questioned if all you need is love is really true. <coughs> Perhaps all you need is love was the message needed in 1967 when John Lennon wrote that song. But today we are called to ask ourselves if love really is all we need. Love is the foundation of human relationships, and it keeps us alive. But to be liberating, love requires commitment and courage and a willingness to be uncomfortable and uncertain. Sometimes love comes easily, but love also asks us to do hard things. Love calls us to be better people. The first letter of Paul to the Corinthians in the New Testament says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love never fails. This is where we are called to have faith to put our love into action and to trust that it will never fail. Love is sometimes easy. It's easy to love our cats and babies and people we agree with and people who share our culture and our values. And we need those relationships in order to restore and comfort ourselves. But we are also called by our faith to live into love as an action, one that stretches us and grows our souls. And this is the definition of liberating love. Liberating love is love that requires some courage and some willingness to be uncomfortable. It requires us to take risks and be open to disappointment or even hurt. Liberating love calls us to do hard things and possibly fail. For our love to be liberatory, we must be brave enough to stand up for what we believe is right. And that's not easy. It's easier to take the path of least resistance and just be quiet. But liberating love means we unapologetically stand up for people who have been marginalized. And I struggle with this one a lot. It's hard to speak up. In the reading that Mandy shared with us today, Ra Gore reminded us that when we do things with love, we pay attention to those details. That means we listen to e others and we bear witness, and we also lift up folks who haven't had a voice, and we listen. 
And even if we don't understand or we can't relate to another person, we accept them as they are. That's not easy. It's challenging not just to tolerate, but actually to embrace diversity. Because to open ourselves to other points of view and ways of doing things requires a certain humility, a decentering of ourselves and our point of view. We are forced to confront the reality that there are other points of view and that they may be valid and worthy. And in order for us to fearlessly and humbly decenter ourselves, we must first know who we are and what we stand for. Because if we can know, know and love and forgive ourselves, then we are less afraid of others. Loving ourselves is liberating love. Loving ourselves gives us the courage to venture into the unknown. Black author and poet Maya Angelou, who is now a beloved memory, said, I'm grateful to have been loved and to be loved now and to be able to love because that liberates. Love liberates. It doesn't just hold. That's ego. Love liberates. It doesn't bind. When we operate out of this generosity of heart that Ms. Angelou wrote of, we're able to fearlessly say, I love you even when you don't listen to me. I had to make sure I didn't look at Jason at that moment. I love you even when you, all of us. I love you when you disagree with me. I love you when you get on my nerves. I'm not looking at anybody when I say that. I love you when you worship differently. I love you when you vote differently. When you interrupt, I'm not looking at you, Matthew. I love you when you interrupt me, when you don't, when you push my boundaries. I see the divine spark. Now I can look at everybody. The divine spark in me sees the divine spark in you. Our spirits are bigger and richer when we cultivate our courage to step out of our comfort zones, even when it's uncomfortable. But what a blessing this big love can be. Serving migrants in our community this past few weeks is a manifestation of this big love and this congregation's willingness to step out of our comfort zones. Having a rabbi or an Episcopal priest or another guest in our pulpit has opened us up to different perspectives, and it means we have to open our hearts a little bit wider and be courageous and confident in who we are while still open to new ideas and perspectives. Welcoming diversity isn't simple because we have to discern where our covenants and our core values call us to speak up and where we are called to live in peace and mutual respect, even with differing opinions. So it's not a free-for-all, it's a discernment. Here in Unitarian Universalism, we use our eight principles as touchstones for that discernment. We create covenants that serve as guides and protectors of our commitment to those core values of peace and justice and liberation for all people. This morning, we gathered with one of our most beloved UU, well, I won't call it a UU song. I, I have to be careful. One of the most beloved songs that we share in UU worship, Wo Ya Ya. I picked Wo Ya Ya as the theme of my ordination ceremony a couple years ago because it articulates the trust and faith we must have as we move forward into the unknown and into the world. Wo Ya Ya is from the Ghanaian Ga language, and it means we are going. It's a simple song, for those of you who haven't sung it one million times like we have. <laughs> we are going. Heaven knows where we are going. But we will know when we get there. We will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we will know. It will be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. And that is faith. It's a humble faith that says, we don't agree here on what name to call the divine force of love that connects us, but we have faith that our values and our covenants are big enough to hold us in liberating love. And in order to expand the reaches of our liberating love, we know that we need to be multicultural. 
We believe that doing our part to dismantle systems of oppression and standing up for the marginalized is how we knock down the barriers to multiculturalism. Liberating love has to be multicultural if it's going to be big enough to hold all of humanity. Our covenants call us to love our neighbors as ourselves, and it's very difficult to love people if we just view them from afar, if we don't share community and relationships with people who are different. In the late 90s, I lived in an eco-village in Ireland. Eight of us came together from various parts of Ireland and Europe, and I was the Yank, the American, as I was called in the town, and we were all passionate about living sustainably and teaching other people to do the same. Now, we had lots of visitors to our eco-village from all over the world. We ran permaculture design courses, and it was a busy little international little community. We traveled around Western Europe to promote our project, to educate people. So even though we lived a mile outside of the tiny little town of Clonus, we weren't actually isolated from other people. But we did tend to share space mostly with people of like minds. As the millennium approached, this is the late 90s, our little cluster of environmentalists started to worry about you all, about everybody else. What was going to happen, now you, if you're of a certain age, you'll remember this fear that now seems silly, when the computers changed the year 2000 and everything was going <laughs> to shut down, right? Now we laugh, but <laughs> we wondered then, would there be chaos? Would people be able to get food in the grocery stores? Would airplanes fly? And like many people, we wondered if the developed world would descend into chaos, lawlessness, and war. It seems silly now, but from our perspective 25 years ago, in rural Ireland, mainstream culture in the developed world had started to seem pretty scary and precarious. And I got to say, that's not totally misguided, but we did, we developed a little bit of an us and them mentality. And we got a little bit afraid of other people. What were people thinking and what were they going to do? Now, we were Irish and American and British and Cornish, but we weren't really multicultural because we were all environmentalists and we were just from different places. It became a little bit easy to start to feel superior and to fear people who didn't share our beliefs. If we don't, all of us, mix with people who think differently than we do, then we start to make assumptions about others. And the only cure for that fear and that tendency that we think we know what someone else is thinking or feeling is to be in proximity with them. Our country is so divided right now. People are scared of each other, and it just leads to more divisiveness. It leads to us all clustering around with people who think like we do. But our willingness to be in relationship with others is, the tru is our truest expression of liberating love. And even though it's not always comfortable to be in community with people we disagree with, we do it because we know that we are better together. We have the opportunity to become braver and kinder and wiser and better stewards of our fellow humans when we are willing to be uncomfortable in order to be truly multicultural. This afternoon, after the chili cook-off, we will gather here to discuss, as a congregation, our next steps in the endless work of building beloved community. We will ask ourselves, how can our commitment to liberating love, a courageous and responsible love with boundaries and wisdom, become action? How can that liberating love fuel us to expand our hearts to include a diversity of people in our wider community, as well as any person that walks through those doors or joins us online? How can our liberating love give us the energy to work towards a world where everyone has food and shelter and is safe? How can our liberating love inspire us to keep doing our work to dismantle systems of oppression and racism and to take a breath and to decenter our own point of view and make room for other points of view, other theologies, different opinions, different ways of being in the world?
Can we make room for the youngest ones who move like lightning and elephants through our sanctuary? <laughs> <laughs> and the oldest among us who move slower and make, might take more time and care, and everyone in between, the loud ones and the quiet ones. We are called by our Unitarian Universalist faith to make room for all of this. And that is a blessing because liberating love resonates with our deepest humanity. When we love one another, we feel the connection that binds us beyond identities and cultures and opinions. A love that flows through the natural world and each of us as beings of divine light and channels for mutual liberation. I'd like to leave you today with a short poem by the Indian mystic Rabindranath Tagore. My daughter read this at our wedding a couple years ago. He writes, send us the love which is cool and pure, like the rain that blesses the thirsty earth and fills the homely earth in jars. Send us the love that would soak down into the center of being and from there would spread like the unseen sap through the branching tree of life, giving birth to fruits and flowers. Send us the love that keeps the heart still with fullness of peace. Blessed be and may it be so.